Hey guys, and welcome to another video. Um, you know, I took about a week off after the holidays and the public outcry was deafening uh, with people saying, hey, where's our new video? So I'm fa finally back in action and I have a great video for you today. Actually, a lot of exciting stuff. I'm really excited to show you. Um, and in fact, we used to call these gun Santa videos, but the holidays are over and it's getting a little stale. So we'll revive that again uh, next holiday season. But for now, let's do these as show and tell videos. So welcome to one of our show and tell videos. Here, I'm gonna show you some of the things that came in this week. And I've got a lot of really cool guns to show you. Okay, uh, first and foremost, I did win this one on auction uh, and uh, uh, just right before the holidays and just got it. This is a full auto Thompson submachine gun. Uh, most of you are familiar with this. It's really cool eye candy, which is why we made this our thumbnail because um, we're hoping that it's clickbait. Other than pretty girls, what m would be more enticing than to see a Thompson submachine gun on my lap? So one of the questions we get whenever we have a full auto is, can I own this? Uh, the answer is yes. If you, can, uh, if you can pass a background check, you can own one of these. It's a much more extensive background check. It, it includes fingerprinting and um, uh, ATF does an extensive background check. The transfer process can take anywhere from six months to 12 months. Uh, during COVID, it's taken a little bit longer. We're hoping things will speed up a little bit. But as a licensed dealer, we're able to, I was able to get this in, uh, in about two weeks, which is uh, record time. Um, but when we go to sell it, unless you are a licensed dealer, it's going to take you six to 12 months and uh, there's some fees involved. But uh, so you can own one of these. Uh, they're a lot of fun to shoot. Um, I'm sure Ian has shot them, so we'll let you go to Ian's uh, channel, Forgotten Weapons, and you can see him shooting a Thompson. I just want to show this to you and get it out the door. Uh, now, this happens to be a model uh, 1928. Before this, they made a model 1921, and we have sold those. There's some slight differences. You can probably see here, here's a 1921. Um, and coming back to the 28, you can see that, first of all, they added this front handguard, which is uh, real important to me because I never really knew where to, I, I it wasn't comfortable holding the barrel. Uh, this has a rib barrel. Um, this also has the uh, snail drum. Uh, it also comes with stick mags. I'll show you that. But this is the snail drum configuration. Uh, this holds uh, 50 rounds. Uh, they also make a Thompson drum in 100 rounds. Um, they added a compensator here. Um, I'll show you this. We have to move in a little closer, but uh, maybe you can see. This has a Thompson logo on it. And, um, and then it also says Auto Ordnance. This gun was made by Auto Ordnance. It has patent dates on them of 1927. Uh, and again, this is a, mo a model 1928. Here's just a couple other features I'll show you quickly. I could do a whole video just on this and perhaps I will, but believe it or not, I need to research this one a little bit because I don't fully understand uh, the meaning here. Um, what happened is the serial number was removed and then this was stamped IRS and the number. So my fantasy would be that this was seized, seized by the IRS from a bootlegger and they stamped it uh, or um, it was issued to the IRS and, because uh, when you don't pay your taxes, they come to your door with a Thompson. Um, and I would probably say, here's my records and leave the Thompson. A couple other interesting features. Uh, this is the selector switch. So in this position, this is full auto. And when you flip it around, uh, that would be semi-auto. Um, this is a safety feature. And then this is the mag release. So when I push this up. I started to push it down, but when I push this up, this will slide right in and out and it, you have to click it uh, to have it stay in place. I, I mistakenly uh, push this button and it'll fall right through. Yeah. If I do that, it, it just falls right through if I push that button. So you want to cl click it into place. Uh, let me show you the stick mags. Uh, this came with several pouches, and I actually like this configuration. The, the drum mag reminds me of the bootlegger, Roaring Twenty era, when this was carried by uh, the feds, uh, the, the tax man, the IRS, and then also for the bootleggers, ATF would show up uh, to seize your alcohol. Uh, but the other configuration I like this for is uh, U.S. Marine Corps, and they did not use the drum mag, they used the stick mags. And when I open this up, these are all marked. I, I'm not sure what that means. Maybe uh, one of the viewers 
uh, who might know, uh, might collect military, uh, might know what that means. But obviously that was easily recognizable for some reason, uh, would stand out and you would pop this in. This is a uh, heavy gun and that pops in like that. And that's the configuration, if you watch a war movie, that's pretty much uh, the configuration you'll, you'll see. Uh, which movie was it? Hacksaw Ridge, I saw a lot of Thompsons being used. Uh, was used by the Marine Corps. These were ideal for jungle warfare because you just spray into the jungle. Uh, very durable, very accurate. Uh, this one, by the way, uh, not military style, is a Lyman sight, which is adjustable. Um, and I already mentioned this compensator, but I didn't mention um, the reason they put the compensator on, you can see how this port will allow the gases to go up. And I found out firsthand uh, why you would want to do that. I had a model 1921 and I took it to a local indoor range. Um, and they had soundproofing all around and in particular the ceiling was popcorn ceiling, which is my sprayed, um, sprayed soundproofing on, on the ceiling. And so I brought, the, I, I brought this and I said, do you mind if I shoot the Thompson? and did not have the compensator. And um, I was told they tend to, when they fire, it tends to raise. And the guy said, that's fine, just don't hit my ceiling. So I had my Thompson, I was holding it nice and firm, and I, I, I pulled the trigger and immediately, whoosh, it went straight up, hit the ceiling, and it just started snowing as all the popcorn came down. The guy was not at all happy with me, but I overcame uh, his disdain uh, by letting him shoot it, and in fact, he did the 50, uh, 50 round drum and, and put all 50 rounds through it. The compensator prevents it from ra raising as much because the gas is going up, helps to hold the barrel down. Uh, so I'm looking forward to shooting this one. By the way, it is an open bolt um, firing mechanism, so when you fire the gun, it slams forward. So I I'm gonna show you how that works. Basically. Um, it, this is cut out for the sight, but I was wondering why in the world did they do that? But that's cut out so for the sight. Um, you push it back and it's ready to fire. Uh, when you pull this, it has a distinct sound as it slams forward. And of course, when it hits the 45 caliber bullet, that pushes this back and then it just, it just continues to fire until you uh, release the trigger. So. That's the uh, Thompson submachine gun. It'll be going on our site. Uh, the estimated price on this in auction was about 20,000, but they tend to go a little bit higher than that, about 25,000. Uh, the earlier ones sell for more. This particular model sells a little bit less. Okay, uh, next I have a, a surprise to show you. I uh, actually, when this came in, the uh, boys, I have like five guys working here and I said, hey, check this out. What do you think is in here? And we had a little guessing game, but of course, uh, I guess it's given away right away. STG 44. So a Sturmgewehr, uh, American Tactical. So what's that all about? A very cool looking case. Uh, so let's check it out. We open it up and there actually is a Sturmgewehr in here. Uh, and it's made by GSG. Uh, German sporting rifles. A group of these guns, I'm not sure how many, um, but a group of these guns were made about nine or 10 years ago. Uh, they sold out quickly, and as far as I know, they haven't been made since. I did try to find them online. I saw past sales, but nothing current. So uh, generally, they're just not available. If you ever find one, they sell uh, very quickly. But uh, I just wanted you to show, show you that this is actually screwed down. This is screwed down. This is not going anywhere. Tight as a drum, uh, not a Thompson drum. We just showed you that, but tight as a drum. Um, and let's uh, give me a minute to open this up and put it together. Okay. You can see that I uh, removed all the packing materials and uh, it's easy to pop this together. Um, actually, there's a, this is the, an exact replica of the spring, uh, the pin. Uh, there's a little spring here. Uh, it's a little bit tricky, so I'm not going to try to do that on camera. Uh, but I remove the pin. I pop this together and then uh, put the pin back on. That holds the, uh, the buttstock to the rest of the gun, to the receiver. Um, now, a couple interesting features. This is an exact replica of everything from the, uh, the, top, uh, the top storage. Oh, there's something in there. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, the top little storage piece where they, they would put a manual and a spare firing pin, I believe. But in this case, it's a little safety device. So we'll put that back in there um, to show uh, the gun is not loaded. Um, but that's an exact replica. Other than looking brand new, this is exactly what the Sturm Gewehr STG 44 will look like. Uh, this is the import mark, tells us who brought it into the country and that it was made in Germany. Um, there's a video of one being shot and I think uh, it looks really cool. So check out this video of somebody shooting one of these. Now, one of the features of the uh, Sturmgewehr, which I think is pretty cool, uh, this is, uh, looks a lot like an AR-15 in that when I pull the, uh, the bolt back, you'll see the dust cover fly open exactly like the AR-15. So the Germans were well ahead of their time with this design. Um, it does have where the ma Oops, I forgot to put in the pin. <laughs> So this was almost in pristine condition. I apologize. Good thing it's my gun. Um, uh, it, it includes um, the magazine, which holds 24 rounds, uh, pops in very simply. Uh, this is the exact same feature, uh, the mag release. Everything is exactly the same as the original, except this one was made in the, uh, uh, in the uh, I think around 2010, about 10 years ago. This is this, uh, the safety and fire. Of course, it does not come in full auto, uh, 22 caliber long rifle. Uh, it, it has the uh, original, what I call the stacker. A lot of people think this is a gas plug, but well, I guess it could be a gas plug, but it also uh, acts as a pin for st stacking rifles uh, up against each other. I demonstrated that in another video when I did a video on the uh, Sturmgewehr. So again, this is a replica, but it is an exact model of the STG-44, done with precision and in a remarkable way. Uh, everything about this, every feature about this gun is very, very cool. So when I saw this, I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, this is like got to be like $1,500. Heck, the case alone, just look at that case. There's $300 there. I was shocked to find out when they first uh, sold these in the United States, uh, these uh, sold uh, retail price was about $600. Again, I can't find them anywhere uh, for sale, but I saw uh, past sales. Uh, which I think is a bargain. It's no wonder they sold out and they don't know, are no longer available. Um, and I don't, know what, um, I don't know what the current price would be, so I'm not going to put it on my site. What I'm going to do is put it on GunBroker for a dollar. Best way to find out what something is worth. People write to me all the time if it's an obscure gun uh, and people say, I don't know what this is worth. The best way to find out is put it on GunBroker for a dollar and see where she goes. Nobody knows. But um, I uh, would love for you to check it out and watch it with me. We'll have about a uh, two-week auction starting um, as soon as this video comes out. And what you can do, I, I'm not allowed to give you a link to uh, any of our guns, um, but if you go to Gun Broker and if you search under STG44, we will put that in the title, STG44. So go to Gun Broker, search for STG44, and you'll be able to find our auctions there. Now, every week I have anywhere from 30 to 60 items that we, we auction off at a dollar. Uh, people tell me all the time I don't come to your site because things are too expensive. Well, tip of the day. Um, go to Gun Broker and uh, check out our auctions. Uh, again, they start at a dollar, and sometimes they go for crazy money um, and other, I uh, mean, high to our favor. They go for crazy prices. Uh, and then other times things sell pretty cheap. I think, um, I have no idea what this will sell for, but I'm going to guess between $1,200 and $1,500. But why don't you watch it with me? All of our auctions end on Sunday night, uh, Eastern time in the United States between uh, 8 and 9 o'clock p.m. And so I watch it every night to see uh, where some of these things go. So check it out, gunbroker.com. STG 44. And then if, uh, if you want an easy way to get to our, our listings, just make uh, Legacy Collectibles one of your favorite sellers, and then you'll get notification when we uh, list new things, which is uh, pretty much every week. Hey, let's keep moving along here. I got uh, some really cool things to show you. Hey, are you having fun yet? Because we're about to have a lot more fun. This gun came in this week, and uh, when I saw it, I thought, oh my gosh, this is almost too good to be true. Let, let's just check this out. So uh, this is a late war Remington 1911 
Um, late meaning 1944, maybe 1945. I have to double check the serial number on that. Uh, you can see this is in brand new condition. It's like a time capsule. The, the most important part, I had a hair on it, that, that got, that's got to go. Um, the most important part that you can show this is like unused is uh, take a look at the ejection port. You don't even see, you know, when you rack the slide on one of these, uh, and I'm not going to do it, when you pull that back, it's, it's, it's going to put wear on that ejection port, and there's not even wear on the ejection port. Um, I was a little worried that it was refinished. I asked an expert who would be a third party, neutral party, meaning once I own this, of course, I think it's all original. I asked a third party without telling him I bought it. I just said, what do you think of this gun? And he couldn't get his jaw off the ground. Um, he was just amazed and said, this is brand new. Now, it came with this, which is a Boyt holster. So these came together. It's very believable that if it was made in 44, 45, that it was never issued. And in fact, this package was never opened. Now, there's a little piece of tape here, and I know whenever I do something on the internet, people like to call me a liar, say that was totally fake. This has never been opened. There's a little hole here. There's a Boyt holster in here. And if it's 1945 and these came together, uh, that's going to be really cool. If these came together and this turns out to be 1950, that's not going to be so cool. So let's open it together uh, live on the air. Uh, this has not been cut. This is tape and it's not open. So I am not lying when I tell you I'm going to take a razor blade and cut the top and we're going to pull this out and see what it is together. How cool is that? I'll be right back. Okay. I haven't peeked yet, right, Randy? Okay, good. Um, but before I open it up and show you what's inside, I have to tell you a funny story. Um, I had two young collectors, I, I, they were teenagers, came in with their dad, and I showed them, they watched the videos, and so I showed them, uh, I said, here's what I'm gonna do uh, on my next video, and I'm gonna open this up. Now, this is a shout out to Peter and Ryan, who came in together, and Future Collectors of America. Um, but when I said I was going to open this, open this live on the air, one of them said, isn't that going to hurt the value? <laughs> and the truth is, it will. Uh, once you open this, uh, it does hurt the value, but I'll never know what's inside. I can't sleep at night. I got to find out. So let's, let's take a look. It's very dirty, by the way. Oh my gosh. It's a mouse. <laughs> now look at, oh my gosh. Holy, oh my gosh, hit the jackpot. A boy, 1944. Oh my gosh, look at that. The green, uh, I think that's called Verita, Vera, not varicose veins, but what is that, Randy? I know, it's uh, the green stuff from uh, oxidation. Same here, look at that. Let's open this up. Uh, surprise, surprise, tight as a drum. Again, not the Thompson drum. This is that brand new time capsule. No fakery here. Opened it live. There's a the little mold spores. I did a video on how to get rid of mold spores. You heat it in the oven at about 200 degrees for 15 minutes. Um, I will clean off that. I wish I, Verit I'm going to go ask Chris. I'll be right back. Yeah, we couldn't find the word. Maybe I just dreamt it. But one of our, uh, one of our viewers would definitely comment, and uh, there's a word that begins with a V. But uh, anyway, this is uh, corrosion oxidation. This is phenomenal holster. Comes with this. Oh, my gosh. Um, and just in case uh, 100 of you are going to ask, no, it is not for sale. I just have to put this one away. A lot of fun here. Okay, now another fun story. Okay, another gun that came in this week uh, was a factory engraved Walder PP. Uh, now we know from the serial number 215, uh, there are uh, several hundred factory engraved guns in that same serial range. I did a whole video on factory engraved guns. You might want to check it out. So I put this on, I, you know, I always debate, should I keep it or should I sell it? Can't keep everything and I have other um, engraved guns. So I decided, um, let's go ahead and put it on the website. I put it on the website and one of my regular customers, Pete, um, he contacted me and said, what, <laughs> what are you thinking? 
you're selling that gun? I was like, yeah. He's like, that gun is the consecutive serial number to the one in the video um, of an engraved gun taken from an SS officer in Buchenwald. And sure enough, I went back and checked my record. Silly me, I didn't check when it came in. Uh, this is the gun from Buchenwald. Now, I did a video on this gun before, and I talked about the story of the, the vet who brought it home, Ted Blaisdell, and he literally, on his deathbed, he was on his deathbed, and his uh, healthcare uh, uh, nurse uh, helped him write out the story, and it was in his handwriting, because the handwriting was very shaky, and he, he signed it and said this came from Buchenwald, uh, and he took it from a dead SS officer. Now, he was an observation pilot who, uh, who flew dignitaries. In fact, he, he flew Eisenhower several times uh, from uh, England up to the front lines, meet with the troops, and then back again. And uh, he was uh, going into Buchenwald and bringing people back and forth. Uh, said he took this from a dead SS officer. And one of the things that surprised me was how many people wrote to me with indignation and said, that man's a liar. Uh, he didn't take it from an SS officer. That never happened. Totally made up. Total BS story. Um, well, I find that extremely offensive. Uh, and the Because, <laughs> yes, uh, memories do change and fade. Let's give the guy a little bit of credit. Um, there is probably some truth to the story and also some embellishment over uh, the next 80 years. Uh, heck, my stories get embellished within a week. Um, but the other comment that I get that I get really energized about is a lot of people, when I say this was taken from a dead SOS officer, um, people write and say, you mean he stole it? Um, and I just want to say, give me a break, guys. <laughs> Every army throughout history, when they conquer a nation, they take their guns, they take their weapons. And that's just one of the things you do. And you would be very naive to not uh, understand that there was plans, uh, the SS had plans to fight an insurgency, um, basically uh, that they would hide in the Alps after the, uh, the allies came in and a little bit of time went by, then they would uh, uh, conduct guerrilla warfare, uh, similar to what happened in Afghanistan and Iraq. And so when you, con when you conquer a country, you take their guns. Um, most of those guns were destroyed, but in fact, some of the guns, uh, commanding officers, uh, allowed their soldiers to take home souvenirs. I've heard stories that you're allowed to take one or two guns home. Obviously, some people brought home a lot more, um, but many guns, I did hear stories about guns being piled up, gasoline poured on them, and they were lit on fire. Um, so, Please don't comment that these guns are stolen. These are considered the spoils of war, and um, whether you were alive or dead, uh, your guns were taken from you, and they were either destroyed or kept by soldiers, allied soldiers, as souvenirs. Um, so let's take a look at the guns really quickly. Uh, the engraving is remarkably similar. Uh, this one has a little more bluing. This one may never have, it's almost like a tarnished look in the recessed areas. Let's take a look at the serials numbers. I'm being very careful not to handle the metal too much. For those of you who say you should have worn gloves, you're right, I should have. Um, but then my gloves would have been dirty from that last viewing. Um, you can see on this one, the trigger is a little bit of plum color. So this definitely was blued. This one I, I, I think might be in the white metal with just a little bit of tar tarnish in the recessed areas. This one has what we call a box mag, which is just a, like a finger extension. Uh, take a look at the front strap. Uh, what I find interesting is the uh, Eagle N proof. Uh, when I saw it at first, I thought, this is, this is a little too small. Um, but when you look at them, they were the same stamp. Clearly, that was the same stamp and a little bit smaller than other Eagle Ns I've seen. Um, underneath here, you can see these are exactly the same. And uh, just an incredible find, consecutive number. Um, you'll see the engraving on the safety lever. And then one other feature worth noting is if you look at the grip screw, uh, the grip screw on both, they're both engraved. Even the escutcheon on the other side, you can see, is engraved. 
So um, I just thought that was really cool. Uh, shout out to Pete, who was the one who let me know. I owe you a favor, Pete. He likes to hear that. Um, but he was the one that uh, gave me the heads up on consecutive numbers. So I will put these away. Um, taken from a dead SS officer. And this one, I'm not sure how it came here, but um, clearly it was a GI bring back. Uh, let's look at a, a, a couple Lugers. So as soon as I see the holster, I know this is Swiss. It has a unique design, but that is a Swiss holster, little extended barrel. Most of the Swiss Lugers that we have sold have been um, DWM marked right here, and then also a Swiss cross right here. Here's a quick look at, at one. Uh, we've had the model 1900, um, which has the dish toggle, and then we've also sold 1906s. This is a model 1906, not made in 1906, but the model 1906 has the grip safety. It comes in 30 caliber, which I'm not gonna point that at you, uh, but 30 caliber, uh, which is what the Swiss preferred. Most of their Lugers were made in 30 caliber. This one was licensed by DWM and made by the Swiss. Now, in this little note from the guy who uh, obtained this gun, uh, he said that the Swiss guns were made better than the German guns. Uh, I think the Germans would dispute that. They both are very well made, um, but of course the Germans thought they did them better and the Swiss thought they did them better. Uh, and the Swiss cross, by the way, is a much smaller cross. Um, there is no chamber date. The grips are a little bit different. This is the unique uh, Swiss um, mag bottom. It has a little dish in it. Uh, so this is a 1906 Waffen Fabrique Swiss Burn with a small uh, cross. Now, I probably wouldn't have shown this to you other than the fact what makes this uh, so unique. Uh, the holster has the serial number right here and then uh, the name Escher. You may not be able to see it, but it is there and it is documented. Very, I mean, this is the part that makes this so remarkable. According to this booklet, uh, this gun was given to Carl Escher. Um, he received this pistol and it gives the pistol number. Uh, when he went to officer's training school in 1924, it has the small Swiss cross instead of the larger one. It was made by the Swiss um, instead of the Germans. And he, he goes on to say that they were, they were known as uh, better workmanship and they were known for their unique grips. Well, that part is true, has uh, unique grips. Um, uh, Carl's widow was not interested in keeping this one, and so it was offered for sale. So then uh, this, this book is a, a record book, and that's Escher Carl. So Carl Escher, uh, this is, <laughs> you got to love the Swiss and the Germans for keeping records on all of this. And a hundred years later, here we are holding it. So this is his record book. And um, as I paged through, I could see... Um, that he was offered, uh, there's his signature, Carl Escher. And uh, there's uh, actually a number of guns um, that were issued to him. Uh, what I found interesting, I'll show you one record. Uh, these are different guns that were issued him. Like, for example, I see um, pistol, pistol holster mentioned here. I see a revolver with a serial number mentioned here. Um, and I see records from 1924, when he got the Luger, um, all the way up to 1948. So he was in officer's training school. Uh, the condition of the gun would reflect the uh, Swiss military. They rarely uh, fought in any battles. Um, uh, but of course, they did have a military and a strong police force and were very active in World War II, but were in neutral countries, so uh, did not fight. Yeah, maybe somebody can tell me a little bit about that. what that means. Kriegs, no, actually Kriegs is um, battle or war. So this is for um, the military. And the one that I wanted to show you on, on page 14, let's go to that. On page 14, you see 1924, and there's the serial number of the gun. So this was when it was issued um, to Carl, in 1924. So 
100 years later, we have the record book of this gun. So just one more uh, look at the gun. You do see the serial number here. And again, that was in the record book. Uh, one other thing that's noteworthy. So this was uh, issued to him in the military. And then later, when the military upgraded to a different uh, model, they sold these privately. So the P63 means that it was sold privately, not sold to a private, but sold privately uh, to the commercial market and eventually ended up in the United States along with the records. And there are no import marks on this. So this could have been a vet bring back or something uh, that, uh, oh, actually vets, uh, my own father-in-law when he was stationed in Germany, he went to Switzerland and visited there and went to different shops and villages and sent things home. I've mentioned that before, but unfortunately didn't send any guns home. Instead, he sent home Hummels and little doilies and silver, silver items, which my wife loves, but I said I wish he had sent back more guns. Uh, so just a unique find. Uh, this will be going on the website as well. Okay, I'm gonna close this out with three more Lugers. These are all reworked Lugers, and usually I skip over the reworks uh, because they might be less interesting. But in this case, I think they're worth mentioning. I got three reworked Lugers. And by the way, these tend to sell a little bit cheaper. Uh, so between a thousand, uh, certainly under 2000 and more than a thousand. Every reworked Luger that is double stamped, they're all stamped 1920. I'll turn them over and make it a little easier for you to see. I, I don't believe that 1920 was the only year they reworked them. But I think what must have happened is when they were sent to rework, they were renumbered 1920 and then for the next year or so uh, they worked through these pistols because they reworked thousands and thousands of pistols so uh, generally these are from world war one uh, this one is 1917 um, this one is dwm whereas this one is uh, erfurt and 1914. Um, this one you can see the police seer safety so we know that it was reworked and sent to the police. They were not allowed to uh, give these guns to the military. In fact, they took them from the military and then they reworked them for commercial use um, or police use, but they were forbidden uh, to uh, rearm the military at that time. Um, you can see the World War I military proofs on the receiver. And so we know this was used in World War I and then after the war reworked. Uh, again, that one went to the police. This one, you can see that it was issued in World War I. Those are imperial proofs. To the left of the imperial proofs, you actually see a Waffen proof. So again, that could not be 1920. They did send it to be reworked. It likely sat in an armory somewhere. And then when Hitler came to power, he began to defy the Treaty of Vers Versailles and began to secretly rework uh, some of these guns. Now, it's often been said, and what I, I find interesting is, a lot of these reworked guns ended up going to the uh, Waffen-SS um, because uh, the military contracts uh, were all in place by the military, and when the Waffen-SS was formed, um, they didn't have any weapons, so they went to these armories, and that's when these were reworked and restamped. I have one other one. This one is DWM, um, likely a commercial gun. In fact, uh, right here you can see the um, commercial proof. This comes in 9mm. Uh, the finish on here, from here to here, is this is a little shinier. Um, the most of the commercial guns were made in 30 caliber, so this started out as a commercial gun, likely 30 caliber, and then it was reworked, I believe, for the Waffen SS. Um, and so you can see the slight difference between the barrel and the receiver. You can see a definite difference there. Um, and then this is the rework mark. Um, it was reworked and, and it went to the Waffen SS. And in this case, we have some documentation of that fact because this was brought back by a, a vet who was actually a prisoner of war. His name was John Halada. And I'm gonna do a separate video, a tribute to John and his service to our country, and talk a little bit about how this gun was captured. So that will be our next video, so stay tuned for that. Uh, for now, um, we're gonna close out. Hey, thanks for watching. I'm glad we're back in action in a new year with some new guns. I hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you like and subscribe to our channel, and stay tuned because I'm gonna be doing a story that's a tribute to John Halata.